Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome back to the stage your chair, Anita Arnand. Um, thank you very much. Now, um, those of you who were here last year will know that one of the most powerful talks, and I sort of mentioned it yesterday in the introduction, was Kate Granger. Please do come have a seat. Um, Kate Granger, who was talking about how important it is to have human contact, just be a human being with other human beings. Um, it's as simple as saying, my name is. And this talk here is from two people who, who really don't work for the NHS at all. They're not clinicians of any sort, but they do understand empathy and they do deal with empathy and that's a that's a cornerstone to I think what what Kate's message was last year so Belinda Palmer OBE is the founder of a social enterprise called uh, Little Miss Geek she's also the CEO of an award-winning consultancy called Lady Geek uh, a woman after my own heart I wear the geek badge with pride and Martin Richards is here Martin is a senior consultant with a private security company which means among other things and I find this the most tantalizing of all he deals with things like hostage negotiation uh, please put your hands together for our two speakers, Belinda and Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. It's really great to be here. Does anybody know who said this? Come on. Oh, brilliant. It was the CEO of Ryanair, Michael O'Leary and one of the world's least empathic organizations. And Ryanair, in our Empathy Brand Index, Ryanair came 99th out of 100. Um, and every time I travel with Ryanair, I regret it. Now, why? It's not that they fail to get me from point A to point B, which is actually what I pay them for, it's just that I hate myself for having to pay them at all. Um, and they're famous for being awful, right? Right from the way they used to charge you 50 pounds if you didn't print out your boarding pass. There's all these opt-out hidden charges. And there were even rumors of them charging you one pound to go to the toilet. It's no surprise that this was bad for business. And in 2013, Ryanair delivered its first um, decline in profits. And now they're back on top, but the question is why? Well, they have brought some empathy into the product mix. They've done a couple of things. They've increased the carry-on baggage, they've got rid of their unallocated seating, and they've even encouraged their cabin crew to smile occasionally. And it could be down to lots of factors, but their profits in March of these this year were up two-thirds. And that very same CEO, Michael O'Leary, said this. <laughs> so, case in point. And the, is this a one-off? Or can any company or any organization be more empathic? And that is the question we have been exploring at Lady Geek for the last year. And what we have found conclusively is that any company can be more empathic, and this will make you closer to your customers, more responsive, and ultimately more profitable. So what I want to do today is explore three things. I want to define empathy. What does it really mean? I want to dispel some of the myths around empathy and also give you some very tangible examples of empathic and non-empathic behavior. And we've got some examples from, your, from the NHS Twitter feed. And I'm really, actually, going back, um, I'm really lucky to have Martin, as Anita said, a hostage negotiator with me today. And Martin has been in the police for over 30 years. And he is going to talk after me about how empathy can save lives. But how did I get into empathy? Well, Professor Baron Cohen has developed a formula called the empathizer and the systemizer. He is a neuroscientist at Cambridge University. And we, I started to look at brain type at the same time that I had two children. I have a son and a daughter. 
And I think in my 20s, I thought one, does, one is not born a woman, one becomes one. And then I had a son and a daughter, and everything changed. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else shares that view here. Um, and at the same time, I started looking into Baron Cohen's work. And what he said is that we are all on a spectrum, but a, we all have a brain type, and we tend to be one way or the other. And the systemizer mode of thinking is about logic, hierarchy, and analysis. And the empathizer way of thinking is about thinking about other people and your impact on others. And of course, not all men are systemizers and not all women are empathizers. But statistically, on average, we do find that more women fit on the empathy spectrum than on the systemizer spectrum. The question is, and my own son, actually, um, he's an extreme systemizer. I mean, he loves Pokemon and don't even get me started on match attacks. And my daughter is an empathizer and she loves being with other people and understanding her social impact on the world. So that was how we started to look at empathy and get interested in it. And then we started to say, okay, could we apply that to the business world? And what we found was that in very male-dominated companies, they were much more likely to be systematic. So companies like technology, finance, and cars, where I work. And I want to give you a definition or more of a formula of what makes an empathic company. Now, we define it as three things. A company that delivers emotion, make me feel something, reassurance, make me trust you, and authenticity, show me you mean it. And it's important to note here that I'm not advocating some touchy-feely niceness. And I know a lot of people in the corporate world where I'm from may think that empathy is feeling sorry for yourself at lunchtime and crying into your prawn sandwich. What I'm talking about when I talk about empathy in business is a hard, measurable metric, a corporate empathy that can be measured from the boardroom to the showroom. And the myth that we often hear is that empathy is soft and fluffy and best relegated to one department. Well, actually, what we found is that empathy is a predictor for company growth and success. Let me give you an example. So at Lady Geek, we work in the we took the top we work in the automotive sector, and we took the top six mo best-selling automotive brands. And what we found was a co it's very hard to look that high. <laughs> what we found is that there is a correlation between empathy and change in market share. And then we took, and that's from our empathy score, so we took the empathy score from our index, and then we looked at the social media empathy score, because we can measure empathy right down to every channel, to an individual tweet. And what we found, again, was an even stronger correlation with change in market share and the social media empathy index. Now, a lot of our clients are measuring things like customer satisfaction. And I imagine that patient satisfaction is key for you. We found no correlation with satisfaction or traditional metrics that our clients were measuring and empathy. So empathy is a key strategy for growth and commercial success. And when we looked at which sectors were more empathic, you know, sectors like the postal, retail, FMCG were the most empathic. And as I said earlier, when we look at the very systematic organized industries like cars, technology, and finance, we found them to be a lot less empathic. But why is all this important? And given that there's so many things to measure, there's so much, um, so much to do, why should empathy be a priority? Well, something has changed. Um, and one of the things, I'll come on to actually what's changed in a minute, but before we do that, the really good news here is that you, I used to think, I used to think that you're born with a certain amount of empathy. And the reality is, the amount of empathy that you end up with has no correlation to the amount of empathy that you start off with. And so it's a bit like muscles. So some people are born with bigger muscles and they can develop them when you go to the gym. Well, empathy is like that. And, you know, we're all work in progress, especially me. So I think that's one of the key myths around empathy. And the other myth 
is that empathy is all about solving other people's problems. And I am terrible at this. <laughs> I always, when someone tells me a problem, I immediately want to solve it. Um, and Martin's going to talk much more about why that isn't always necessarily the right thing to do. But what has changed? Going back to my point, social media has changed everything. We live in an increasingly transparent world, and it is no longer okay to just provide goods and services as a company. We demand companies to have a human face. We demand companies to deliver their messages with humanity and authenticity and personality and feeling. And we demand that they do it with a genuineness born of empathy. And the other great thing about social media is it's given us a live barometer of how people feel about you. Whether it's your latest financial results, whether it's a latest campaign, social media gives us real-time feedback on the impact you as an organization, you as a business, have on your audience. And when we looked at our index and who does well, I mean, LinkedIn did brilliantly on the index. So a lot of, um, and I, I want to say, in an individual, what's key here is understanding where the empathy deficit is in your organization. So in terms of some businesses, so Amazon, their empathy deficit isn't with customers. Customers love Amazon. It's actually internally. With Selfridges, they have an empathy deficit both internally in their organization and with customers. There's lots of glamour, but very little empathy. And they came 87th in our index. And John Lewis, now John Lewis is a really empathic company, but on social media, they had an empathy deficit because they were only responding to tweets that were positive. They've since rectified that. And HSBC is brilliant at resolving problems and not kind of fobbing you off. And when you look at LinkedIn, who did brilliantly, and you compare them to on Twitter, so delivering empathy on Twitter, and we can measure, we've built an algorithm where we can measure down to an individual tweet how empathic you are. If you look at LinkedIn versus Twitter, and it's probably a bit hard to see, but you can see that LinkedIn deliver responses with emotion, reassurance, and authenticity. They use names, going back to Anita's point. They make you feel like they really care. They don't, compared to Twitter, who use lots of stock phrases, lots of repetition, and they just sound like it's a robot, and they take you somewhere else. So there's no humanity. And when we looked at NHS England, and when we looked at NHS Choices, actually, we found a similar thing going on here. A lack of emotion, a lack of reassurance, and a lack of authenticity. For example, you know, just sending people somewhere else. You know, and there's this person who responded, you know, it felt like you were passing the buck. Um, same with NHS Choices. Again, sending people just being repetitive, sending people to other places to get, to, to get an answer. And then we looked at NA Give Blood, and we found a completely different story here, where there was much more empathy, much more emotion, and much more engagement. So what I've done is talk to you about empathy in business. And the key message I want to leave you with is that empathy can be taught and it can be measured. And it is a strategy for growth. But what Martin's going to talk about now is how empathy can save lives. You may have seen a... Am I on? You may have seen a... Not a very good slide for an NHS conference, maybe. Um, but it makes a point. What I'm going to do is talk through those three myths that Belinda mentioned and apply it to my world, um, having been a negotiator for over 15 years, but also I want you to reflect on your frontline staff, maybe, your paramedics, your GPs, the people who work in A&E, and how this can also correlate with uh, the profession I've come from. 
And the first uh, myth that Belinda mentioned was around it's a fluffy tool, pink and fluffy, empathy. And it certainly is not. Um, I mean, I can tell you cases, one particular case in northwest London where there was a guy, um, it was a child custody dispute, and he had a knife to his six-month-old baby's throat, threatening to kill his own baby. Now, what I had to do there was to turn up and demonstrate instant empathy in order to build rapport with that individual. Because if you build rapport with people, you can influence. And if you can influence people, you can get them to change their behavior. And it's not about giving people what they want. That's not what empathy is about. What empathy is about is demonstrating respect to the person. Now, I've dealt with many a kidnapper who will ask for the stereotypical, I want a million dollars and they'll end up getting about $6,000. And that's a fact. So we resist. But what we do when we resist is we demonstrate respect, because nothing will upset a kidnapper more than, not, than misunderstanding what they want. Now, I'm sure you have patients who can be incredibly demanding, and you can have patients who can complain um, and want but it's no different to a kidnapper who's asking for lots of money and threatening to kill your staff. It's exactly the same. So what's important is not giving in to the demand, because you might not be able to give in to the demand. It might be without your reach. But what's important is actually listening, not misunderstanding it, mirroring it, writing it down, getting it right. So if somebody asks you in a week's time, what did I ask? that I wanted, what did I ask you to give me, you can recall it straight away. And that shows respect. Another dangerous slide. So guns. So what have guns got to do with empathy? Well, Belinda mentioned um, that empathy can't be taught uh, and that you end up with the same amount of empathy that you're born with. Not true. And I'm, again, a classic example of that. One of my roles in the Metropolitan Police was to be in charge of a firearms team. So I went from a job, which is probably the most unempathetic job, because all I used to do in my staff was to drive around London, point guns at people, and threaten to shoot them. So from that department, I went into a department which is probably the most empathetic department, and that's to be a hostage negotiator. So from one day you go from pointing guns at people to the next day you go to trying to save somebody's life who wants to jump off a bridge in the River Thames or jump off a crane in central London. Now that takes training. And this is the point. You can teach people to be empathetic. And I'm living proof of that. And a lot of police negotiators have had decades of being institutionalized in macho orientated occupations like the firearms department, and then they become negotiators. So it can be taught. Now, you can all be empathetic when you want to be and when it's natural. If a child falls over in front of you, the first thing you're going to do is show empathy because it's a natural instinct. But you try and be empathetic when you're woken up at two in the morning, you have to drive to central London, you have to climb a tree and it's freezing cold and negotiate with somebody who you don't like because all they're doing is yelling abuse at you for three hours. You try and be empathetic and it's really difficult. And that's why you're taught to be empathetic. Because once you know what the actual detail of empathy is and what active listening is, and how to be empathetic, then you can do it in an environment that it's not natural for you. Because it's very difficult for you to, be, to show empathy with people you don't like. So your person that walks in your A&E in hospital, who's incredibly angry, drunk, on drugs, yelling abuse at your staff, try and be empathetic with that individual. It's not easy. And so my suggestion is, is that you can teach it, and once you've taught it, you know what to do in a false environment. And the last myth, the slides are getting better now, you see, now we've got a suite. So suites, what's that got to do with empathy? 
Well, Belinda said that the last myth that she said mentioned was it's about problem solving. It's not. What you can do with empathy is you can set a scene and you can create an environment which will help you to problem solve. You can't problem solve through emotions. So when people are emotional, they don't listen. If they don't listen, you can't persuade. Now those who've got a child, you say to a child, you can't have a sweet, what does the child do? It throws itself on the floor, it sticks its hands on its hips, it screams at you, totally rational behavior. At that moment, can you try and problem solve with that child? Not a chance. What you have to do is wait until you've got home and there's a calm environment and you can sit down and you can explain why you didn't give that child that sweet in aisle two of the supermarket. And you do that by demonstrating empathy, but you get rid of the emotions first. So in my old job, I couldn't negotiate with people who are highly emotional. No matter what the emotion was, it can be anger, frustration, sadness, they're all emotions, but you can't problem solve. So by showing empathy, that trying to make an attempt to understand where they come from, once you've got that, then you can problem solve. So empathy in itself is not about problem solving. I think just to finish, take some of your questions just understanding we'd like to ask you three questions you know who is responsible in your own departments for empathy and if the answer is no one you need to appoint someone a chief empathy officer or someone with seniority where is your empathy deficit do you know is it internal is it external where where is it is it on social media and how important are these channels to you and finally, how effective is what you are doing now? You know, do you know how effective things are? Are you measuring the right thing? And are you leveraging social media, which gives you an instant barometer on how people feel? So empathy is good business, and it's also a great strategy. And the best news is it can be taught. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have very limited time. If you have a question, please immediately indicate to a paddle person, and if they stick something up, I will come to you. Uh, but just before, um, just while we're, we're sorting that out, I, I have a question. I mean, I thought your uh, example was really interesting, that um, you know, you're up a tree, you're negotiating with somebody you don't like necessarily. They're shouting and they're screaming at you. And you have to almost, some may say, fake the empathy in that situation. Um, where is the line between the fake empathy and actually being patronising? Because one thing that a patient cannot stand mm. is being patronised. That much we know. So what, where, is the, where is that crossover? So I think it has to be authentic, otherwise it's, not, it's just fake, as you say. But can it be authentic if it's learned? Yeah. Yes. I, 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 I mean, I, I, the more you're empathetic, the more it becomes natural to you. So initially, if you don't feel very empathetic, once you get into the, the talking and once you try and get into understanding what the person's about and what you're about and you're trying to save a life at that moment in time, you become more empathetic. So, I mean, we're never insincere, never shown sincerity when you're trying to save a life. Um, what I'm saying is about it being taught is that once you know what empathy is and once you've broken it down, you're then better able to, sh to demonstrate it in an environment where it's completely false for you. I'm looking around, there don't seem to be questions, and I'm, I'm being empathetic. I think people are thinking about lunch, to be honest with you. Uh, just final question, when you said about having a chief empathy officer, I just noticed a ripple going through uh, the audience. Yes, over here. Yeah, I and, and maybe, maybe it's, what, is that to do with the fact that budgets and how you're gonna pay for an empathy officer, what, what was that about? Personalities, okay, but let, then Tell let me. More, then. Well, no, you don't need to. If it's fine, that's fine. I'm empathising with your privacy. Uh, but just on, on that question of you know sort of having th these are people with very constrained budgets. They have barely enough to um, cover what they're doing at the moment. We're told. Um, how, how important is it? How much of a priority should they make the empathy officer in the scheme of things? 
I guess that's, I think it depends on what you're measuring now and how effective it is because there tends to be so many different measurements and I imagine that's the same in the NHS. There's so many people measuring different things and measuring what they think matters. Um, I think what we've proven here is that empathy does correlate to business success. So from my perspective, I think it's crucial and given that you are about patience and compassion and care, surely empathy has to be at the heart of everything think you do. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are well, 1 minute 40 away from uh, the time when that thing cuts off all of our microphones. Um, can I thank you all very much indeed for being with us and please join with me in thanking our panellists, Belinda Palmer and Martin Richards this afternoon. And uh, again, let me just remind you, because this is my tablet of guilt that they keep putting in front of me because I don't say it enough, uh, you can evaluate every session, go to the website, click whatever clicky thing you need to, and uh, we learn. Thank you very much indeed.